Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Colary. I'm a child and family therapist and a parenting coach and the founder of Connected Parenting. And welcome to the Connected Parenting Weekly Podcast. Join me every week and we'll tackle everything from temper tantrums to bedtime to sibling issues to teenage angst. Parenting can be so wonderful, but it can be so hard. Parents often say to me, hey, can you just come live at my house? This is the next best thing. Let's do this together. Hello, Connected Parents. Okay, so I wanted to talk about polarization today. And I'm recording this uh, in early November of 2020, a crazy time for the United States and the world. And polarization is a huge issue worldwide. We're really seeing it play out in the United States right now. But it's something that I've seen playing out in people's homes and in people's families and the dynamics of of relationships and marriages for ever, (laughs) really. And I see it all the time in my practice when I work with parents. So I wanted to really break it down today and see what we can learn from it. Um, Now, I heard Elizabeth Gilbert speak a while ago, it was an incredible talk that she gave on um, on this topic, and I, I'm going to bring that into the conversation in a moment. Um, but first, I want to kind of define what I, how I see polarization, especially in in families. So it typically shows up this way: one parent is very soft and very nurturing and very loving, and really feels everything that the child is feeling, and and honestly takes on that pain and in in some ways actually feels it more intensely than than the child does Um, and really kind of goes out of the way to make things easier and better. And every time there's a disappointment, it, it, it feels excruciating. And that's sort of a, and not so dramatic. I mean, that, that happens in a lot of our families. That's where I tend to go as a parent. If I'm going to lean one way, that's the way that I'm going to lean. And then there's the opposite to that, which is uh, a parent who is very much about rules and consequences and um, predictability and sticking to things and, you know, respect and, um, and, and it tends to be, you know, sort of, this is ridiculous and this kid is out of control and we've got to do something and this is, this is not okay. And it ends up to being, you know, sort of this intense dynamic approach to parenting. And what ends up happening is with such different uh, polarized responses to the child, um, that can become more and more extreme over time. So each parent, uh, you know, sort of believes the other parent should parent their way. Uh, They feel incredibly undermined by the other one. And in response to that, they end up becoming a caricature. The softer one becomes softer and more permissive and more afraid. And the tougher parent becomes tougher and louder and stronger to compensate for what they believe is a weakness in the other one's parenting. And so you literally become a caricature. Now, there's lots of downsides to this, but we'll just sort of break down a few. If you're the really, really soft parent and um, and that's kind of where you operate from, then typically that child, uh, your child is going to come to you and tell you when things are wrong and they're going to come to you for comfort and they're going to come to you to share, uh, you know, really intense emotional moments. The, the tougher parent, the harsher parent um, is probably not going to enjoy that very much. The child is not going to come to them very often um, for comfort or telling them a problem or discuss anything with them on a deep emotional level. However, when it's time for bed and you've got to get that child to do something, the harsher parent is probably going to have a much easier time getting the kids to do what they need the kids to do. The softer parent is probably going to be running around while one kid's in his pajamas and the other one's taking them off now and this one's running down the hall and this one's not listening at all. So you end up seeing how there are limits if you only parent one way. And the truth is that good parenting is in the middle and that we tend to not marry people who are exact copies of us. That would be probably very unpleasant in very many cases. We usually choose someone who is very complimentary to us. 
um, so that we we become kind of a, a great team together. And we want someone who's actually going to uh, compensate for what we're kind of lacking. And then together, we're an awesome, awesome team. So I want to kind of break down um, on a scale why this actually happens. But I want to start with this. And I think it's really important. Whenever you're in a situation where there's polarized views, the most helpful thing is to find where there is integration. Where are their commonalities? Where do you both want the same thing? So if we take uh, one parent who's super soft, very permissive, um, you know, sort of kind of undermines, which tends to happen, and the other parent who is very tough and all about rules, what do both of those parents have in common? They both love their child very much, right? And they want their child to be equipped to deal with life. So the softer parent wants that child to know their emotions and know their feelings and feel heard and loved and seen and not be guided by shame and anger. Um, And they want them fully integrated. The parent who tends to be tougher and more interested in rules and consequences and containment also loves their child and wants their child to have skills and tools and um, ways of managing and is usually coming from that place of knowing that if they don't teach that lesson, life will. And life is a much harsher teacher. So the beginning, the place where you find that common ground is to always think, okay, where are we in line? Where do we see things the exact same way? And it won't feel like that on the ground. It will not feel like that. But the truth is, in most parenting dynamics, that is the truth. Both parents love their child, and it's coming from this place of wanting the child to have all the tools that they need in life to manage and to be successful. One plays the long game, One plays the short game. Although to be honest, you're both thinking about the long game. So here's what happens. The tougher parent ends up compensating for what they believe is a weakness in the other one's parenting, causing them to become tougher because they have to, because the other one doesn't set enough limits. The softer parent has to become softer and make more space. Okay, come over here. Let's not tell your dad. Let's not tell your mom. Let's work it out this way and creates all of this space to avoid the harshness of the other parent. Both parents in these cases, you will hear both parents because they're in my office every week, will say, I feel undermined, I don't feel valued, um, I feel railroaded, and and both of them are saying the same thing. How is that possible that they're both feeling that way? That that, that is not one of those conversations where it's, it's both people, but that is exactly what happens. So I want to come back to um, the talk that Elizabeth Gilbert gave, because it it really sort of sums this up. She talks about it in terms of gender lines, but you don't have to. You can really think of this in terms of personality. Uh, But she describes this continuum between uh, being the profane male and the profane female. I talk about this also in The Father Effect, which is one of the podcasts that I did last spring. So if you want to hear more about it, you can, you can look at that as well or listen to that as well. So the profane male is smash and grab. It's mine. Screw you. Um, narcissistic, loud, aggressive, um, harsh, kind of pounding the fists on the table or the chest kind of personality. And we can all think of some people who fit that category. Um, on the exact opposite end of that, is the profane female. So this is the you know sort of sneaking around. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Let's not let's not make your dad mad. Let's just do this. Let, okay, come over here. I'll just do it. You know what? I'll just do it. If I do it, there won't be any trouble. Constantly making space, constantly creating um, a situation where the other one is not angry. And that would be the profane female. So, um, and then we have in the middle, we have the divine male and the divine female. So the divine male is a very strong, very confident man who is very comfortable with compassion, honesty, uh, self-reflection, 
you know, just kind of the very in touch with both sides, with the the softer side and also the the kind of strength. And that's that's very beautiful. And that's sort of where we want to be. The modern kind of movement around spirituality has been wonderful, I think, for men. And Elizabeth Gilbert talked about that, that it's really allowed them to get in touch with that side of themselves and and not feel ashamed and not feel like they have to be so tough all the time that they can't show emotions or they can't cry, which is a huge and profound impact on our boys, on our sons, um, and how integrated and and uh, healthy they are in terms of mental health. Um, and then there's the divine female. So this is kind of think Mary Poppins, like very strong, um, very loving still, but very, um, graceful and a lot of grace, but strength. And it's interesting. Elizabeth Gilbert made the point that in this, in this spiritual movement, which has been very good for men, it hasn't been as good for women in some ways. Women have always been historically very compassionate, very, um, understanding, putting their own needs aside, looking after elderly relatives, um, putting their own needs aside to look after their children. Um, so it, for, for a lot of women, it's actually, um, made things harder in some ways. Um, they've been less forgiving of themselves and, oh, I should really be this way. And I've just yelled at my child and, and I should know better. And, um, so it, it hasn't been in, in some ways as helpful, although it has in many other ways. I just, I want, I want women in particular to hear that it is okay and it's actually important for our children and our daughters to have self-compassion, to take care of ourselves, to set those beautiful boundaries around ourselves and say, you know what, I love you, but I'm not doing that for you because I'm tired and because I did a lot today and because I know you can do it. That kind of loving strength is really, really important. And so if we think about Mary Poppins, you didn't mess with Mary Poppins. She didn't have to yell. She didn't have to scream at anyone. You just knew she was dead serious. Um, And if you think about horses, for example, horses are led by the lead mare. So, you know, the the lead mare does not have to fight anyone or, uh, you know, the stallions are off running on their own. The, The lead mare just is, she just has this presence, this strength that makes her the leader. And so it's in the middle of the divine female and the divine male when we are at our absolute best. And I talk about standing in the canoe. That's where you have your balance in the canoe. And when you slip to either end, and it's not always gender lines, um, and, and we can polarize with ourselves. You know, as a parent, a single parent, we can be, you know, yelling and really harsh one day and then, and then super soft the next day. We tend to, to swing and that pendulum just swings back and forth. You know, it's not uncommon um, even in a couple to be swinging that pendulum ourselves, you know, one day it's like, get off the couch. This is my house. It's not a jungle jam. What are you doing? And the next day it's, you know what? Jump on the couch. I don't care. I'm so tired. You guys never listen to me anyway, whatever. Jump on the couch, see what happens. So we can polarize ourselves all of the time. So let's bring this down now to how can we understand this dynamic and what can we do about it? So the first thing is to find that integration. Where are we on the same page? Where, even though it's very different, how does it come down to love, right? How can we redefine the behavior that we see in our partner or our spouse so that we can see it lined up with love? The other part, which is so important, is to look inward. What behavior am I choosing? What am I doing that is bringing out that more extreme behavior in my partner or my spouse. Now, this is really important for me to say here. If you are in a relationship where you believe it's abusive, where, or you know it's abusive, you need to get help. So this is not, this, this is not for you. You need to get some support and some help and get out of there. These, this is for, um, kind of the normal ugliness that happens, um, between uh, couples uh, as they parent. So if it's extreme, please get support and help. Um, I'll even put some links in there uh, of where you can you can find that. This is for normal, everyday kind of ugliness. So what you want to be doing, no matter which side of the pendulum you are on, if you are the parent that is much more interested in limit setting and rules and uh, respect and, and having habits put into place, and which is 
which is very important. And it's not that the other parent doesn't care about these things. It's just which one do you emphasize, right? I'm sure the softer parent also cares about those things, but, but empathy and compassion and softness will dominate. And this is why together you're actually an amazing team. This is why you picked each other. This is why um, you're together. So you can bring out the best in the other person. So the question you need to be asking yourself is, if my wife looks terrified of me, if her eyes are like saucers and she feels like she has to get in between me and the kids and I feel undermined and insulted, where can that energy go? Can I look inward? Can I look at myself and say, why is this happening? Why is my wife behaving this way? Why do my children look, what's going on in me that is causing this reaction? If you sit in the place of a victim, they leave me out, they're mean, nobody respects me in this house, I'm always undermined. If that's where you go, then you're going to stay in a place of weakness. You are not going to change, you are not going to grow, and you're, become, you're going to become um, um, more and more a caricature of the very parts of yourself that are bringing this behavior out in your family. If you are the softer parent, if you are um, you know, creating all this space and 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 telling your kids on the side, you know what, we'll just do it. We just won't let your dad know. And you know deep down, because you're going to get that feeling of like, ugh, I know this isn't great, but I know it's just fear and I don't want to have a confrontation. What are you teaching your kids? And also, look, you're becoming a caricature of yourself in this situation. And you, what will happen is your partner will look at you, see this kind of monstrous um, representation of who they are in your eyes, feel an incredible amount of shame and double down. Um, so you really need to look at is how, what am I bringing out? What behavior am I choosing that is bringing out the behavior in my spouse that I don't like? Now you're in a position of being a student. Now you're a learner. Now you have power right? Because now you can actually change this. I have couples come into my office all the time. This is usually in the first session, although, although it can continue. And they are absolutely convinced. They sit down and they're absolutely convinced that I'm going to take their side and I'm going to blast their partner. And they're going to finally hear from a professional how wrong their partner is. And that will never work. That will never work in a therapeutic. If someone is not ready to see their role in things, they are. that's not going to work. It will never work. They'll just walk out and never come back. The work is to have each person in that relationship look inward. What can I change? What can I do? What is my role? Where am I responsible? Where is my lesson? And when you can do this, and, and even better, when you can say things like that out loud in front of your kids, they are watching. They are watching that strength, that maturity, that knowingness, that belief that together you're a great team. That is a phenomenal example for your children of the position that they should be taking in life. So... The idea is this, and as corny as this sounds, if we cannot figure this out in our own homes, how on earth are we going to figure this out in our communities, in our countries, as a planet? How, if we can't do this in our own homes, it will not be possible outside. So it, I know it seems silly, but if you could literally look at this and think, okay, I'm changing the world by changing myself in my home, in my family right now, by modeling this for my child, by teaching my child to be a student, not a victim. That will bring us both into the center where both of us, we, where we both on both sides care about um, the future and we care about things making sense and we care about order and we care about uh, accountability and responsibility, but we also care about each other and we care about compassion and nurturing and empathy and those really important things need to come together to make each home a better place and ultimately the world a better place. Hi, I'm Barrett Kaleri from Connected Parenting. 